you, Tamara. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, hello from London. Uh, thank you for taking your time to join us for this introduction to esophageal pressure monitoring using the Bella Vista ventilator. So over the coming weeks, uh, VIA will continue to roll out invitations uh, to join webinars on advanced features and their clinical application in the hospital. Uh, today we're going to define some of the key working terms related to uh, esophageal pressure monitoring and also the rationale for using this technology. We'll also share some details of the required accessories and the tips for uh, placing the likes of the esophageal catheter in the ICU. We'll also take a walk through the Bella Vista user interface and identify some key landmarks when you're using the technology. So I want to start off by asking you a couple of questions, essentially to set the tone around the importance of lung protective ventilation. So if you could be uh, so kind as to answer this question that's on the screen at the moment uh, by sending a chat response to Tamara, uh, simply use the WebEx chat that's at the top of your screen and I'm just looking for a best guess. So how many breaths, how many ventilated breaths can it take to create a lung injury? Yes, and the answers are already coming in. We are just waiting a couple more seconds. Thank you all very much. That looks good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we have very often the answer one and there is also the answer 30. Okay. And here comes so, again a one. Yes. Okay. So we've got quite, quite a spread there, yeah? So second question, second question of two. So in a moment, I'm going to display a video um, of our Bella Vista cockpit, and I'd appreciate you answering this question in the same way as you've just done a moment ago. Uh, simply send the message again through the chat tool. So, in this scenario with quite benign settings, how many opportunities are there to potentially cause lung injury each day? So, take a look at the parameters, the settings, etc. So, we just want to know how many opportunities there are potential, potentially available to cause lung injury per day. Yes, and I'm already receiving answers here. Just a moment, please. Craig has already answered, for example, Paloma. Yes, and more are coming in. Somebody is saying no injury. Then we have uh, five, for example, and many times we have the answer 14,400. Uh -huh. Okay, super. So, yes, the clue is there, the rate being set at 10. So, 14, with a rate of 10, there are over 14,000 opportunities each day for the clinician to get the ventilation strategy right or potentially wrong for the patient laying in the ICU bed. And you see here, that rate of 10, so 10 breaths per minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day. So 10 times 60 times 24. So that's where that number came from. So in short, clinicians have two key ventilation goals when caring for the ventilated patient. Firstly, maintain an adequate functional residual capacity, or FRC. So that's the volume of air present in the lungs at the end of a passive expiration. Secondly, they want to minimize the risk of regional lung over distension whilst also providing an adequate minute of ventilation. So we want to walk you through the introduction uh, to esophageal pressure monitoring uh, via the, this webinar today with the aim that you'll see how this can be supported in the ICU. There's a wealth of lung protective literature and resources for clinicians to access, 
and indeed the conference circuit typically features a respiratory tract. So there's a lot of dialogue, a lot of noise out there about what people should be doing to protect the patients. So despite the advances made in the care of the ventilated patient, the battle is far from over. So you see on the screen here, the Lung Safe Group, which is part of the European Society for Intensive Care Medicine, found that nearly a quarter of ventilated patients develop acute respiratory, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And almost half of those patients are at risk of death or at least an extended length of stay in the hospital from lung injury. So we still have a way to go. So during lung injury, the alveoli uh, begins to become unstable and we start seeing repetitive alveolar collapse and expansion, a term that's been coined as RACE, R-A-C-E. So this is further accentuated by the position of the patient in a supine position and the associated weight of the organs. In this model here on the screen, you see how the inappropriate application of PEEP impairs alveolar stability. So you're seeing that over distension and collapse. So the, the alveoli here, they're incredibly unstable and opening and closing or collapsing with each moment of expiration. As part of the lung injury cycle, you'll likely see an increase of capillary permeability and you have an increase uh, in the intravascular lung water. And of course, this is aided by the deactivation of surfactants and the release of other inflammatory mediators uh, that we have within the lung. And this in turn destabilizes the alveoli and allows it to collapse during the expiratory phase. The microscopic evaluation here illustrates the stress failure in pulmonary capillaries with associated leakage from the capillary bed. You can see here how it's breaking through and being released. So here, these peak seem quite contented, well managed, they're not being over distended, they're not collapsing, you're avoiding that race scenario. Um, it appears that PEEP not only improves oxygenation, but it also stabilizes the alveoli while decreasing athletic trauma. So here you see, I'll just hit play again, here you see with appropriate PEEP application, the alveoli are nice and stable and de demonstrating less collapse during the expiratory phase. So how do we know that we have an open lung peep? How do we know that we reach a peep that keeps the lung open during the expiratory phase? Well, there are a number of ways. For instance, we can use the table from the ARSNET group, uh, volumetric capnography, ultrasound, EIT, etc. What we're going to discuss here over the next few minutes is the use of esophageal pressure and transpulmonary pressure monitoring. So how do we measure the transpulmonary pressure and how do we manage the acute lung injury in ARDS patients using esophageal pressure monitoring and transpulmonary pressures? Well, we need to take into account that the plateau pressure is just measuring one side of the equation. When you, de when you have a decreased chest wall compliance caused by maybe obesity, edema, changes in the intra-abdominal pressure following surgery, following septic resuscitations, pregnancy or scarring following burns, there's going to be changes in the chest wall that are going to significantly affect the way you measure your plateau pressure. So just to apply some context here, when a musician plays the trumpet, pressures at the airway opening can be up to about 150 centimeters of water. The trumpet player blows for only about a few seconds and there's a rapid in lung volume. Trumpet players generate these high pressures hundreds or even thousands of times a day, but they don't generate barotrauma. They don't get ventilator-induced lung injury or villi. The reason is that it's not the airway pressure per se that's important. What's important is lung stretch or the transpulmonary pressure, the pressure across the lung. And for a trumpet player to generate such high airway pressures, he has to contract his respiratory muscles to generate a high pleural pressure 
so that the transpulmonary pressure is not increased. So the final concept is that lung distension, not airway pressure, is a critical determinant in generating ventilator-induced lung injury. That has very important clinical implications in patients who have stiff chest walls, for instance, those aforementioned patients that might be obese or they might have a massive ascites. In these situations, peak airway pressure and plateau pressure may be high, but most of the pressure is dissipated in distending the chest. The lung is not necessarily being over distended in this situation here. Don't forget that the plateau pressure measures only the airway pressure in a static moment. We need to know the transpulmonary pressure for our purposes today. The best way we can go about measuring the transpulmonary pressure is by measuring the other side of the equation, which is the pleural pressure. It would be very difficult to directly measure pressure in the pleura. Therefore, we place an esophageal catheter either nasogastric nasogastrically or orogastrically to measure a surrogate, which is the esophageal pressure. So you see here the catheter is placed and the balloon sits in the retrocardiac space. This little equation here is crucial. So you see here, transpulmonary pressure is generated by your airway pressure minus your esophageal pressure. So remember, the esophageal pressure is a surrogate for your pleural pressure. So I've broken out three zones of interest here. So the blue highlights the pressure in the airways, your pore, and that's being measured at the circuit line. So a DET tube. So it's not the actual pressure in the lungs, but the pressure of the entire respiratory system, and it's reflecting both the lung and the pleural pressures. The green area is our pleural pressure, which we're using esophageal pressure as a surrogate for. This is the pressure that's imposed upon the lungs by the chest wall and abdomen. We're approximating this by, using, by the use of an esophageal catheter placed in the esophagus. The red, this is your true pressure within the lung. So, as I said before, it's the airway pressure minus the esophageal pressure gives you your transpulmonary pressure. So, the pressure across this lung membrane here. So, why are we using the esophageal pressure as a surrogate for pleural pressure? If we look at this CT scan here, we can see that the esophagus is, very, is in very close proximity to the pleural space. So you see here, right, so we've marked it up as yellow for you. At this point in time in the retrocardiac area, in about the distal third of the esophagus, the pressure of the esophagus is very close to the pleural pressure, which will give us the true transpulmonary pressure. However, there's a caveat there. We need to consider that pressure within the pleural space is not uniform and that Pressure in the basal regions is typically greater than the upper regions of the thoracic cage, up in your apices. Well, we use an esophageal pressure catheter that has a balloon which fits in the distal part of the esophagus. As you can see here, down here, and then your balloon is in the retrocardiac space, and it's been passed either orogastrically or nasogastrically, like you would with any other NG tube. So the esophageal balloon probe step provides you with complete accessories for esophageal pressure monitoring. This one here isn't available in the US at the moment. So the hypothesis is patients with increased pleural pressures with conventional setting, if we don't give them enough pressure, we're going to cause underinflation and a resultant hypoxemia. Also in these patients, we'd have to raise the peak to maintain the positive transpulmonary pressure that improves the aeration and oxygenation without over distension and preventing atelect trauma. The goal is to provide enough transpulmonary pressure to maintain an acceptable oxygenation for the patient and prevent that race that repeated alveolar collapse and expansion while minimizing over distension. So we're effectively
already adding several pieces of additional information for the clinician to work with. We're giving them more tools in their toolbox. I note from the registration list that there are a number of people today that will have worked with our Avea ventilator previously, or indeed currently. And I've highlighted two parameters in blue above as they correlate as follows. So you see here the PTA stats is the equivalent to your PTP plateau on Avea. And the PTA equates to the transpulmonary and repeat on Avea. So the debate's ongoing as to what the clinician should aim for number-wise with, uh, with these parameters. However, it appears that we need to aim for a transpulmonary plateau pressure less than 15 centimeters of water. Let's see here. And a transpulmonary peak that is ever so slightly positive. You see some literature, some clinicians are saying it needs to be zero, some will say one, some say it needs to be two, some it needs to be three. We're not going to get in the weeds there, but the consensus seems to be that it needs to be at least ever so slightly positive. When dynamically measured, the parameter is prefixed with a PTP or transpulmonary symbol. Monitor parameters, though, achieved during a hold maneuver are transalveolar, or they have a TA, so you see here, TA and a TA. So these are achieved doing either an inspiratory or an expiratory hold maneuver. While these maneuvers with the TA will not show in the trends, these will display indefinitely or until the next hold maneuver is performed. So the ones with PTP here and here, they'll be displayed dynamically with the TA here and here. They are um, achieved through a hold maneuver. So we're going to change gears and talk about the placement of the balloon probe set. So I've outlined a number of scenarios here where placement of the esophageal catheter would not be appropriate and therefore contraindicated. You'll see that most of them apply to quite common sense scenarios that are linked to recent surgery, trauma, or maybe a coagulopathy. The esophageal balloon probe set um, illustrated here provides you with all the accessories you need uh, for esophageal pressure monitoring. Alternatives to this catheter are the Nutrivent um, and the Cooper surgical catheters, both of those which incorporate feeding options. So there's the part number for the esophageal catheter that's displayed here on the screen. So there's a number of steps that we need to take. So before inserting the balloon into the patient, you need to take a look at the kit that you've, that you've just opened. So you're going to have your balloon catheter, which is a six French. You're going to have two extension lines. You're going to have a P-OGS interface connector, which is um, silicone. And there's a three-way stopcock in there. So check the, the integrity of the package, remove the balloon from the package, inspect the, this balloon for damage, and replace it if there's any signs of damage to the integrity of the balloon. If no damage is present or visible, check all your connectors, the three-way stopcock, your syringe, and your extension tubing. To approximate the level of placement, measure the distance from the tip of the nose to the ear, and then from the earlobe to the distal tip of the gastric area of the patient. So from here to here, down to here. So if your patient's awake, of course, you're going to obtain consent. Otherwise, select an unobstructed, unharmed nostril. So of course, you're not going to use a nostril that maybe already has a nasogastric tube in there or if there's signs of trauma. Apply some anesthetic lubricant, such as lignocaine gel, 2% at the nair, and also apply some lubricants to the tip of the balloon probe. You see the balloon probe here has these little beads. They are so that it's radio-opaque uh, when you do uh, uh, chest uh, or abdominal x-ray, um, and they're made of stainless steel, and they're bound within the catheter. The catheter that I showed you a moment ago has a stylet. So check that this stylet is inserted into the catheter. Withdraw it about, withdraw it 
um, about one centimeter from the endpoint of the catheter. Position the patient in an upright position at about 45 degrees or in a beach chair type position. That's the one that we recommend. Before inserting the catheter, lean the head slightly forward, insert the non-inflated catheter gently and slowly through the nostril and towards the hypopharynx. Keep advancing the catheter by the esophagus until the estimated length is reached and the catheter is placed in the stomach. That's usually about 60 centimeters in a typical average adult. After you've inserted it, remove the stylet with a gentle continuous traction while holding the catheter at the nostril. If the stylet binds in the catheter during removal, recline the head of the patient a little to straighten out the probe. Once the stylet is removed, do not reinsert the stylet again because reinsertion of the stylet into the catheter is likely to damage the probe. So you see here the stylet is being removed from the catheter. You're then going to need to connect the probe to the extension line and the three-way stopcock. Connect the stopcock and the second ex extension line to the P-OX interface at the right-hand side of the ventilator. So you see here, took down at the bottom is the green P-OX port, and that silicone connector just, just slides over and fits nice and snugly there. Once the stopcock opens, sorry, open the stopcock to the balloon catheter balloon catheter and inflate the syringe with 5 mils of air and then aspirate 4.5 mils of air again which leaves you with a total of 0 0.5 mils in the balloon. Close the stopcock to the syringe afterwards. So when you've taken your 4.5 mils out you're just going to turn this stopcock around to face the syringe here leaving half a mil in the balloon. So then you're going to go into your Bella Vista maneuver screen and you're going to check your esophageal pressure curve. The esophageal pressure should increase during inspiration and by manually compressing the stomach area gently right below the xiphoid. If the esophageal pressure is similar to your airway pressure, then you need to consider that maybe the catheter could be incorrectly placed, for instance, in the trachea. In this case, simply deflate the balloon and remove the catheter. So what are we looking for in our waveform? Well, if the esophageal pressure confirms your manual pressure maneuver, pull the catheter slowly into its final position. When the waveform displays cardiac oscillations, you should, you should have reached an appropriate position, which is gonna be in the retrocardiac space. So you see here, you have your airway pressure waveform, and you have your esophageal pressure waveform. Along this waveform are the cardiac oscillations. This is what you're going to be keeping an eye out for. If they're quite flattened, for instance, you might want to just review your CVP, check that whether the patient is appropriately filled or not, because uh, sometimes they can be somewhat flattened if that's the case. When the patient is mandatory ventilated, the inspiratory esophageal pressure should be positive, in spontaneous breathing patients, the inspiratory esophageal pressure shows values towards the baseline. So you'll see here that you have two options available, and these can be selected in the configuration assist window, which we'll show you in a moment. So you see that POX, you can pretty much measure any pressure that might be abdominal pressures, it might be cup pressures on your endotracheal tube. Um, the alternative option for your transpulmonary pressure monitoring provides you much more scope to work with. And I'll show you here how you can toggle between those two options. So we've gone into our configuration assist screen here, down to the PSP OX. Here we go. You see up here, the esophageal balloon is displayed. If you're switching to POX, you're going to lose these options here. Your balloon has also dis disappeared. 
if you want to switch it back on again, just press it again and PES and your balloon reappears on the screen. So you know that you're measuring esophageal pressure. So your waveforms. Well, here you see the three key waveform parameters called out in the beginning. So whereas you're used to seeing, um, for instance, maybe a pressure flow volume waveform, in the screen, you're going to probably want to have it set up so that you can see the airway pressure, esophageal pressure, and your resultant transpulmonary pressure. So remember that the PCP is a calculated parameter, whereas esophageal pressure is monitored. There's airway pressure minus esophageal pressure gives you PTP. That's almost A minus B gives you C. So here we'll demonstrate the steps required to establish a baseline evaluation using an expiratory hold followed by an, an inspiratory hold. So I paired it with our animated lung as well for visibility. So we're going to our maneuver screen, and then pressing and holding the expiratory hold button is going to give us our resultant peak TA. So keep an eye here. Okay, so that's maybe just a little bit more than we would typically aim for, so the clinician would consider modifying their settings accordingly. Moving on to inspiratory hold maneuvers, this allows the clinician to generate the PTA stat which is here. Okay, and we said before, we wanted to typically keep it below 15. So here, airway pressure minus esophageal pressure gives you your transpulmonary pressure. Now, the animated lung provides a great graphical support by showing negative or positive transpulmonary pressure parameters during mandatory ventilation. When end expiratory pressure is negative, the animated lung will show an orange border around the lung to indicate potential de-recruitment of the patient's lung. You see here, orange. The orange color was selected to allow distinction between a red low compliant lung and the associated border. When the end expiratory transpulmonary pressure is positive, the animated lung will show a green border around the lung. And this number here, the PTPX, once it is ever so slightly positive, by about 0 0.5 positive, it will turn green. So you have that visual cue for the clinician in the ICU. Do note, though, that once spontaneous breathing is above 20%, there is no green or red border. You can see here that the percentage response is zero. So there'll always be believers and non-believers with any type any technology, and you'll always find a piece of literature that supports a technique, and you'll always find a piece of literature that discourages the use of it. Esophageal pressure monitoring simply serves as one of the many potential tools in the clinician toolbox, like I mentioned before. Um, just having a look at some of the numbers recently, to see that um, using um, esophageal pressure monitoring to guide your ventilation um, resulted in a marked reduction in the need for ECMO, which, as we all know, is, is, is certainly expensive. Um, the, whereas a catheter, um, a esophageal catheter, costs maybe one or two hundred dollars, um, on average, the cost of ECMO per patient can certainly uh, be significantly more than that. If you're particularly interested in the what the uh, key opinion leaders are saying about the use of pleural pressure, then the plug working group uh, might be of interest to you. So here's the website, um, but also just, just look for the, the plug 
working group, and there there are all lots of information about pleural pressure um, in the ICU space. Additionally, the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, so ETICHEM, they have their lung safe uh, working group, and like I say, lots of information about um, applying esophageal pressure and transpulmonary pressure in the ICU. There are um, a number of webinars um, and blogs um, being posted at the moment by the ESICEM group, obviously in light of the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis that we're facing. That might be of interest to you. But for our purposes, I'll wrap up there and just see if there are any questions. Yes, Anthony, thanks very much. Um, I would like to read a question from uh, Florencia. Is there any quick guide to help doctors during balloon insertion and about the complete maneuver? Yes, there are. Yes, there is, sorry. Um, that is with our Marcom team at the moment being created. Um, and it also includes those steps that I was walking you through before. So, yes, there are some trouble. There's a quick reference guide that includes troubleshooting tips, insertion techniques, and um, uh, clinical references. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, I don't have a timeline when that will be released, but it is in the works. Thanks very much, Anthony. And uh, as soon as uh, the documents become released, we would also post them in Vision, and you would receive a notification by email then, all business partners and by your people. So um, next question I would like to come to is from Nadia. Can you feed the patient can you feed the patient using the esophageal catheter in Bella Vista? The one that I showed you on the screen, it does not have a feeding port. Um, however, the Nutrivent uh, and the Cooper Surgical catheters um, that are available on the open market do uh, feature a feeding port. Thanks very much for the answer. So, um, dear participants, if there is anything else you would like to know, then please send your question here in the chat window. Uh, yes, next one is coming from Sue. How fast should the syringe be injected? Will the speed affect the readings? The, I guess common sense would apply here with the clinician. A slow and steady inflation and slow and steady withdrawal of the air would be advised. Thank you very much. And Anthony Natasha is asking you, how long can the catheter be left in C24? Typically that would be at the discretion of the local hospital infection control team. Um, they have a policy in place, so it probably a would probably be aligned with their nasogastric feeding catheter um, policy. All right. Subash would like to know, can you use TPP in passively breathing PTs? Yes, you can. Thanks. And another one, do we have studies in NIV PTs? Um, I've not seen so much with NIV, most of the literature that I've seen um, seems to be pertaining to patients that are um, intubated. Um, I've, I've not looked for um, NIV um, applications, but um, like I said, the, the wealth of the material seems to be around um, patients that are that have an endotracheal tube, so they're intubated. But interesting question. We can have a look. So, thank you very much. There is no more question. No, no other questions here from our participants. So, um, with you. this, I would like to finish the training.